Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the response. So gave it. Um, so I've had some questions um, about the paper over email, so I figured even though it's a little early, it probably wouldn't hurt to talk about it today just to get you thinking um, along these lines, to give you plenty of time to prep. Um, so essentially what I want you to do um, is a close reading of a single text, right? So you can choose any text that we read prior to about midterm. So, you know, there are things we haven't read yet that are fine for you to, uh, to use as well. Um, essentially, what I want you to do is look for some pattern of detail that you think is meaningful in one of these texts, right? Let's say, like, maybe there's an image that repeats. Um, you'll recall, like, you know, when we talked about uh, Gilgamesh, right? Somebody brought up the doors. You know, there are, you know, this, these repeated references to doors in Gilgamesh, right? There are these parallel phrases. <laughs> Um, you know, that uh, talk about what's good in human life versus, you know, what immortality gives people. These are the sorts of things you want to look for, right? Patterns that you think relate to some sort of bigger idea in the text, right? That civilizing pattern that always follows the same trajectory in Gilgamesh would be another sort of example of the sort of thing that might be a subject you could write on, right? Um, basically, what you're going to what you're going to be doing, right, is you're going to be looking for one of these patterns, and you're not going to be arguing for the existence of this particular pattern, right? You're not going to tell me, oh, hey, this pattern is there. That's great. That's wonderful, right? What I want to know instead is why this pattern is important and what you think it means. Right, so that's what you're going to be doing. Paper is going to be 2,000 to 2,500 words, so roughly four to five pages. Um, works cited page does not count towards the word count. Um, and you will not be using any outside sources for this. Right? This is just coming out of the anthology in your own head. So I want to see what you can do with one of these texts without relying on sources. Um, as far as the uh, formatting stuff is concerned, right? this is all posted on Georgia View. We can all read, but just briefly. Um, Got to be in 12-point type, times the Roman font, double space. Please remember to double space it. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I also do not want you putting extra spaces between the paragraphs. Right? Everybody knows right, that MS Word defaults to that. That if you don't go into the paragraph tab up here, right? normally it will say remove space after paragraph here. Right? So you would click on that, and that shuts that function off. I just want you to shut that function off. That's all that means. 2,000 words is the minimum acceptable word count, and the paper must be uploaded to the Dropbox in Georgia View by, by 11.59, roughly midnight, on Friday the 24th of February. Um, now, just a couple of things about how your paper is going to be graded. Right. The big things that I'm concerned about are originality and clarity, right? Let's start with clarity because that's a little bit simpler, a little bit more basic, right? I do want a basic level of grammatical comprehensibility at the very least, right? By and large, I'm not grading on the basis of spelling, style, grammar. I'm really much more interested in your ideas, but it doesn't matter if your ideas are good if I can't understand what you're trying to tell me, right? So you don't want Twitter style. Yes, please, yes. No, no hashtags, no Twitter style. Um, yeah, full sentences, you know, avoid sentence fragments, run on sentences, all that sort of thing, right? Basically, just make sure that it's written in a way that it's relatively easy for you to read, right? And this is, this is about clarity, right? This is just about making sure you're understood. Uh, make sure your paper is organized in a way that makes sense to a reader who is not you and cannot read your mind, right? I do not have superpowers. I am not a telepath. Um, I can, the only evidence I have of your intention for the paper is what you put in front of me. So I need the paper to be organized in a way that makes sense not just to you but to a reader, right? Now this probably means that you're not going to be able to just sort of spit out ideas in the order that you thought of them. This will require you to sort of sit down and think about which paragraphs belong together, right? Which ideas relate to each other? 
in general, it's a good idea to put your second strongest idea first and your strongest idea last. That's just throwing that out there. Um, finally, you're going to be quoting the text directly for evidence, right? And that is one thing that I do want to reiterate here. It's not on the assignment sheet, but one thing I want to make sure you do, right? I have heard that many of you have had instructors that have discouraged you from quoting things directly. I want you to quote things directly, right? I want you to actually quote the lines of text that you're talking about. And I want you to always explain when you're quoting why they mean what you think they mean, right? You need to provide that logical link between your evidence and the way you interpret it because that's not always going to be obvious. All right, as far as originality is concerned, right, one, make sure that your thesis is sufficiently complex and is actually arguable, right? So make sure that you come up with an idea that it is possible for someone else to disagree with. Right, so this is not going to be a literal surface interpretation of whatever text you're talking about, right? I want you to dig a little deeper and find something in it that it's possible for somebody else to take issue with. And this idea needs to be rooted in the concrete details of the text. Or it needs to be rooted in the actual language of the text. This goes back to what I said about quoting your evidence directly. Right? Show me exactly where you're getting your ideas from. If you, if you make sure that everything you're writing is rooted in the concrete details of the text as well, it often sort of prevents you from interpreting things in ways that are, uh, shall we say, wacky or implausible. Um, okay, uh, so, does anybody have any questions? That's right, yeah, Megan. Let's say someone wanted to really get an A on this paper. If we wrote it up ahead of time, would you be open to reading it and giving us feedback? Absolutely, yeah. There, there are no required drafts for this assignment, but if I get a draft from you at least 48 hours before the due date, I guarantee I will read it and make comments on it. Um, the reason I, I sort of make 48 hours the limit is because I feel like that's the well, I, I, yeah, I, I put it like if you're doing it uh, sort of within the 48 hour window, then you're not going to have as much time to actually go over and absorb the feedback and put it into practice. I do also give extra credit if you go to the writing center. So if you go to the writing center and I get that email back that says, you know, Louisa came to the writing center and we talked about blah. And you know they don't send me an email back that said that you were belligerent or um, <coughs> otherwise unhelpful. Then you will get uh, half a letter grade extra credit, right? So you know your B becomes a B plus, your B plus becomes an A minus, so on and so forth. So definitely worth your time to go and do it. Um, any other questions? Yeah, Louisa. I know you wanted uh, direct quotes. Do you want a block quote, or is that too much for a five-page paper? It depends on how much you're quoting. Basically, anything that is four lines of text or longer uh, should be a block quote. Um, in most cases, you're probably not going to need to quote that much text. So, you know, make sure when you're quoting that you're actually quoting the part that you need and not sort of adding extra filler words. But yeah, you do use block quotes if, you're, um, if the quote is longer than four lines. Yeah, Darlene. Two questions. So sure. when quoting, you want us to use just the part with the words that we need. You don't want any background on it if it's like helps that one part make sense. Or um, I'm not sure what you mean by background. Because like if we're quoting on a certain spot and it's like two lines, but there yeah. were events that happened before that that make that two lines. Okay, the, 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 then that you can summarize or paraphrase. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then the second question, I've never been to the Writing Center. Do we just ask them to like email you that we've been there? Or um, yeah, the, essentially, like when, when you fill out the appointment, li little scheduling thing, uh, it's on the website. Okay. You can go through the English Department website to get okay. there. Um, 
<clears throat> you'll you'll schedule an appointment. They do take walk-ins as well, but it's better if you schedule an appointment in advance. Um, you know, it'll ask if you want your instructor to be contacted, and you just click that box, and they'll send me an email. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? So we'll be working on this in class. Pardon? Will, will we be working on this assignment in class, or this mm, at home? No, we will not be working on this assignment in class. You will you will be working on it on it at home, but. Again, um, as I mentioned, like I am willing to work with you if you come to my office or if you shoot me an email. And you're still adamant that we can't use the one that our group project is on? You cannot use the one that your group project is on, no. Got to do something different. Okay. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Uh, the group project. What are you talking about? Okay, you added the class late, so we have, we have to work that out with uh, with you. Um, come talk to me after class. We'll figure something out. Um, okay, uh, anything else? No? Great. Then so, um, I gathered from previous class sessions that some of you have some familiarity already with the Odyssey, right? Okay. Let's try to put our prejudices aside here, all right? Now, <clears throat> what do you already know about the Odyssey? What do you already know about this text? What do you already know going in? How many of you have actually read the whole thing before? Okay, good. That's great. That's a good number, right? What have we performed in the show? Um, okay, that's... Is that different? That's different from actually reading the whole thing, but performing yeah, in the show also... In high school. Okay. Yeah, well, performing in the show is, yeah, that's, that's cool. What, what, what did the show focus on? Like, can you tell me a little bit um, about that? It was more focused on, like, uh, him being the Greek, Greek god. And then, okay. Um, well, most of the, uh, like... Was this a show that we did here? No, it was at uh, a Florida school that was okay. last okay. year. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, didn't he, like, take his mom or something? You're oh, you're thinking of Oedipus. Oh, yes. Never mind. Similar name. <laughs> never mind. Similar name, different, different hero. Yes. Yeah, never mind. Yes. Okay. So, Odyssey. Right. What do you guys know about it? Odyssey, like the prequel. It's not the prequel. It's actually the sequel. Oh, the Other sequel. way around, right? Okay. So the Iliad. That one was the the Iliad was actually good. The Iliad was about the war, and then. Right. And then the Odyssey is a 20 year journey back to Greece. Yes. The Iliad concerns a small portion of the 10 year Trojan War, right? Really like a matter of days. And the Odyssey is set in the aftermath of the war as one of the Greek heroes, Odysseus, tries to make his way home. Okay, so let's actually, let's start with the Iliad here as a little bit of background. What else do you know about the Iliad, or about the Trojan War generally? The horse, that's it. Okay, yep, the horse. Isn't Achilles in? Pardon? Achilles. Yeah, Achilles is the greatest of the Greek warriors in the Trojan War, and Achilles is a rather Gilgamesh-like hero, right? He's not a thinker, he's a doer. Mostly, um, actually a, mo most of what he does is actually killing people. Um, but <clears throat> he actually spends most of the Iliad not killing people, right? Sitting in his tent, sulking, because um, a slave girl for whom he had a great deal of affection has been taken away from him, right? So the focus of the Iliad is on getting Achilles to fight again. Yes, Devante. You're talking about the same Achilles from Troy, right? From the, the that, <laughs> from that abominable Brad Pitt movie? <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. that was a good movie and he was shirtless. No complaints. You cannot argue that. If, if some of you can think the Odyssey is a bad poem, I can think Troy is a bad movie. <laughs> right. I think that's fair, yes? <laughs> Seems pretty fair. All right. Because I'm not going to stop being the Odyssey was horrible. All right, so, yes, it, it, it's, it's the same conflict right now. The difference, like, that movie tries to cover sort of 
a broader span than the Iliad actually does, right? The Iliad is just those few days when Achilles is in a snit sitting in his tent, refusing to fight. I don't know why I feel this way, but didn't they have to travel like across the Mediterranean Sea? Yeah, um, this is actually one of, the, one of the reasons that we think the historical Homer, to the extent that we can know anything about him, we think that he came from uh, what is now Turkey, right? What the Greeks called Asia Minor. That would make perfect sense. Right, somewhere kind of like around here-ish. Because the Iliad is written with a great deal of geographical specificity. Yeah, I heard, uh, I don't remember the explorer, but I, remember, I heard someone actually took the geographical mm -hmm. clues or whatever in the Iliad and it was supposedly able to find Troy. Yeah, it's a, an amateur German archaeologist by the name of Heinrich Schliemann. Um, in the 19th century, yeah, he, he, used the, he, he was obsessed with the Homeric poems, and he used the evidence that he found in the Iliad to locate a buried city in northwestern Turkey that we now call Troy and that we think probably, we think is probably the city that is written about in the Iliad. So yeah. Do um, you just know everything related to this stuff? I mean, I know a lot. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've been, you know, I've, I've been teaching this class for a lot of, for a lot of, a lot of semesters now. So, yeah, a lot of this is just absorbed. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, um, we think Homer is from this region because yeah, the Iliad is written with so much specificity. But then, the Odyssey, like once he leaves this part of the world the geography gets really, really fuzzy. There is a Greek island called Ithaca, but it's not Odysseus's Ithaca. We don't really know where Odysseus's Ithaca is. Um, in fact, a lot of the places Odysseus visits are described as simply being on the edge of the world um, and seem to be the, pardon? They thought the world was flat at that time. They actually did not. In our period of that moment? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, this is actually, um, and we'll just brief aside here, there's a common misconception that when Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, what he discovered was that the earth was, 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 the earth was round. We've always known that the earth was round. The Greeks actually managed to cal uh, calculate its circumference um, almost exactly. The, Chi the ancient Chinese, the same thing. Um, so we've always known the world was round. What Columbus accidentally found was that there was something on the other side from Europe and Asia, right? They thought that the other side of the world was empty and that if you kept sailing west from Spain, what would happen was not that you'd fall off the edge of the earth, but that you'd starve to death. So <clears throat> yeah, they've actually always known that the, that the world was round. Okay, so, <coughs> Where were we? Right, yes, Odysseus um, visits a number of these kind of like fantasy lands that are on the edge of the world. And we'll talk in more detail about what each of these little fantasy lands represents um, as we look at them. We'll be talking more about those next time. The portion that you read for today is more about Odysseus's return from that journey. Yeah, Megan. Couldn't Iliad, though, be like more based on like the writer's home, so to speak, whereas the Odyssey could be based off of like when you travel, especially back in those days. Sure. They would become basically delirious. Well, I mean, and that's I mean that's that's basically the point I'm making, is that the Iliad is so specific, we think because this is where the writer was from. Right. The Odyssey went off into unknown territory, places he didn't know. He's not writing about what he knows anymore. You don't think he could have, like, perhaps, like, put it in as a basis for what he knows, but at the same time, just, I mean, when you read the writers of, or writings of, like, people on ships, I mean, they believed they mm -hmm. saw mermaids and ridiculousness. Well, they were they were also drunk much of the time, but, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, let, let, um, the point is, right, Iliad, very geographically specific, Odyssey takes place in a sort of fuzzy, airy, Kind of fairyland, yeah, Darlene. So because the Iliad, Iliad, mm -hmm. I don't know if I that mm -hmm. um, because the Iliad is so geographically correct, is it 
viewed as a form of like historical literature? Uh, or is it still not not so much. Um, because you still have gods running around knocking down city walls and occasionally fighting with people. Um, you know, and we, we don't have any direct uh, historical correspondence for most of the figures in it, in part because we don't have very much written record of the period in which that takes place. Just about all of the Greek myths actually describe um, a period that is much earlier than, than classical Greece. Right? The two sort of Greek ancestor civilizations are what we're dealing with in texts like this. So the, the earlier is called the Minoan civilization, and this was based on the island of Crete. Right, Crete you know, um, is that sort of big, kind of flat-looking island that is just south of mainland Greece. And the Minoans flourished from roughly 2000 to 1500 BC. This was when their civilization was at its height. The Minoans, from what we can tell, were mostly peaceful, may have been matriarchal, uh, expanded their influence mostly through uh, exploration and trade. They were seafarers. We think they were matriarchal goddess worshippers in part because there have been a lot of figurines found uh, that date from this period on the island of Crete that depict um, a bare-breasted woman holding two snakes that we think is probably the Crete, like some sort of uh, Minoan mother goddess. Right? It seems to have some sort of religious significance. Now we can also connect directly the Minoan civilization to some of the Greek myths. And then, you know, the, uh, the city, the palace complex that's been discovered on the island is covered with these murals that feature um, young men and women participating in some kind of uh, bull riding ceremony, which we think may have been the basis for the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur in the labyrinth. Now, the other ancestor civilization that these myths discuss. And this would be the people that Odysseus and Agamemnon and Achilles would come from, are the Mycenaeans. So this is like Middle Greece? Uh, this is Bronze Age Greece. Both of these would be Bronze Age civilizations. So bronze tools, bronze weapons. Um, certainly like by the time Homer is writing, um, there's been a dark age in between when these civilizations are both lost for reasons we don't, we're not entirely sure about. And Homer is composing these poems basically at the time that um, Greek civilization is coming back and writing has been sort of reinvented or rediscovered. So the Mycenaeans were primarily on mainland Greece. Uh, and they flourished like sort of roughly 1600 to 1100 BCE. So roughly contemporaneous with the uh, Minoans, but uh, outlasted them a bit. And the Mycenaeans were a warrior culture, right? kind of ruled by a warrior aristocracy uh, from palace complexes, much like other Medi ancient Mediterranean civilizations. Right, The palace complexes, you know, were you know, legal proceedings were held, it was where religious proceedings happened, um, where grain was stored. Basically everything in these ancient city-states happened around the palace. Is this like parallel? Pardon? Um, no, I don't know what I'm thinking. You know, uh, the civilization Sparta was from? Sparta is part of the civilization we call classical Greece, right? So this is the foundation for Sparta, Thebes, Athens, uh, Corinth, those more famous city-states. So Sparta was probably, became after where the, I can't say that word. Mycenaeans? Yeah, that thing. Um, the Mycenaeans really are kind of the root of all okay. of those Greek city-states, right? Um, we can see evidence of <clears throat> Mycenaean gods who correspond to Greek gods. Um, the language, the Mycenaeans, but what evidence we have of it seems to be related to classical Greek. 
Um, and the bronze tools that they used are very similar to the later iron tools that classical Greek civilization employed. So yeah, I mean, both of these are root civilizations, our ancestor civilizations, for the people we think of when we think of ancient Greece. So even though the Iliad and the Odyssey were written after that, they were based during those two times? Yes, exactly. Exactly. They're, they're writing about these civilizations, really. Okay. Or a sort of dim and hazy memory of these civilizations. So then how would that not be considered like an ancient historical text? Well, to, writing about them? to them, this is a kind of, it, it is a, a kind of history that comes out of oral tradition, right? But it's highly fanciful, right? So any historical information that we get out of these is largely kind of by the way. Um, it's not what we would call necessarily an accurate history. Um, and it's also, I mean, it's, it's also, it's meant not just to preserve the history of the tribe, but as imaginative literature, right? What we have here are some of the earliest examples of the fully developed epic form. Um, what's an epic? Tell me what an epic is. So form. Yeah, it's, that's, on the most basic level, it's a long verse narrative. Yes, exactly. There are certain kinds of heroic themes that run through epic. Usually, you're dealing with some sort of um, national or cultural crisis. Like a war? Like a war. Especially like in the case of the Trojan War, right? This is a war that draws in all of Greece, and they sail across the sea to do, to do battle against another civilization. So are these kind of like the equivalent of like Native American legends of history, but like Greek form? I don't know enough about Native American legend to really be able to answer that question. Um, what I do know is that epic is by, epic is drawn typically from oral tradition, but it's not, it hasn't remained oral tradition, right? So it's oral tradition that's been transformed into a literary tradition. Weren't they meant to be played? They were recited typically, yeah. There were. Um, professional performers called rhapsodes who would sort of set up on a, uh, be like, you know, they'd set up on a little pedestal somewhere in, you know, Athens or Corinth or wherever, and they would declaim lines from the Iliad, from the Odyssey, or from Theogony, which we, you know, which we read uh, a couple weeks ago, right? They would memorize these bits of poems. And, yeah, they would not usually recite the whole thing at once because, um, would you want to stand up outside um, in hot, hot, dry weather in Greece no. and uh, recite this whole damn thing? I mean, even you know the bit that you read for today would probably take you 45 minutes to an, to an hour to read out loud. If you had to stand there and read the whole thing, right, you'd be exhausted. So yeah, they, they tended only to recite excerpts. But yeah, it was written for recitation. People did recite. That was mostly a male-dominated thing, which would... Later, the whole culture was male-dominated. I mean, like, my understanding, though, that led to the tradition that, like, men would play girl parts later on when they developed, like, plays more. I don't know the extent to which those traditions are related, but you are right that um, in the theater, which we'll talk about um, next week, okay. um, yes, all female parts were played by men. Yes? Okay, so you said that the Greek culture was, like, male Mm -hmm. And I might just not understand what the word means. Matriarch. Okay, the Minoan culture may have been matriarchal, Which so that would that the Minoans dominant. might have been ruled by women. Yes, okay. so but the Mycenaeans changed. definitely were not matriarchal. Okay. Yeah, the the My Mycenaean culture was, from what we can tell, hyper masculine, okay. and the Greek culture that then grows out of that is also hyper masculine. 
So where was I? Epic, yes. Long verse narrative, national cultural crisis, roots in oral tradition. Um, the heroes of epic are usually divine or semi-divine. <clears throat> So <laughs> epics typically involve the acts of gods and demigods. Odysseus is actually unusual in that respect, in that Odysseus is just a, an incredibly talented human being. Right? He's not a demigod. Both his parents are people. Both his parents are human, but he is a king, so he is a culturally important figure. And he is, you know a hell of a fighter and a hell of a thinker. But ultimately, he is just a man. Now, the other thing about epic, and this is, epic is actually, we tend to apply this term more broadly than we should. We tend to apply it to any lengthy ancient world verse narrative, but it's really kind of culturally specific to Greece. They always composed these in the same meter what's called dactylic hexameter. So these are very long lines, right? It's an 18-syllable line. That tends to, the rhythm of which tends to rise and then fall, rise and then fall. How do you spell that first word? The D. D-A-C-T-Y-L-I-C. It's not that important that you remember dactylic hexameter specifically, but just remember that it's a you know rising, falling, rising, falling meter. That they're long lines, and it's you know that the Greeks wrote. Ep you could you could tell the poem you were reading or listening to was an epic because it would be written in this particular style. In fact, um, our word epic comes from the Greek epos, which means both story and poem. So yeah, we tend to apply the term epic to a lot of long ancient world verse narratives, but really um, it only applies to Greek and Roman texts of this type. Now, <clears throat> let's focus on this aspect of epic, the idea that it tends to discuss a kind of, you know, a nation or a culture in crisis and a hero or a god putting things to rights. Um, those of you who have read the whole thing, what is the crisis that has to be put right in the Odyssey? Yeah, Odysseus needs to get back to Ithaca, Ithaca, Ithaca right? The yeah. king needs to return to his kingdom. Yeah, to participate like events and stuff like that. Some people that they're mm -hmm. Yeah, um, he will use when he returns to Ithaca those some of those athletic events as a cover to affect his revenge. But what's been going on in Ithaca in his home kingdom while he's been away? Yeah, there are all of these uh, suitors who have seen, okay, Odysseus is gone. He's probably dead, he's probably not coming back. So they're hanging around his palace, trying to convince his wife uh, to marry them, trying to get his son out of the way, um, you know, through murder if necessary. Um, and uh, <clears throat> basically eating up all of his food, drinking up all of his wine, and sleeping with his maids. So they're not being um, especially good or polite house guests, right? And the kingdom, since it's missing its king, and the heir is still just a boy, is in a state of disorder. And so Odysseus' son, Telemachus, goes off in search of his father. And then we cut to Odysseus. And where has Odysseus been for much of this time? <coughs> Yeah, it's 
It's okay if you don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, the, the island of Ogigia, yeah. Which is ruled by a goddess named Calypso. Right? And he washed up there. Calypso found him, took it in, took him in, took care of him, and has basically been keeping him there as a kind of sex slave for the last decade. Trying to convince trying to convince him to love her. But as we saw in Gilgamesh, right? these mortal-god relationships don't usually work out very well. And Odysseus is firmly conscious of his, of his mortality and does not want to be a god, does not want to enjoy the favors of a goddess, and simply wants to go home. So he spent ten years doing the goddess's bidding, but also trying to get her to let him go home. And finally, the gods send a messenger to her to tell him to tell her to relent and let him go. And that is where we are <clears throat> at the very beginning of the portion I asked you to read for today. Right? This place he washes up in, he, he washes up in, Phaeacia. I can never be sure if I spelled that right. Yep, there's always an extra A. I always miss that extra A. So he washes up on the island of Phaeacia. And what kind of people does he encounter here? Women. Women first, yeah. Aren't they naked? Young girls. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 bathing. Yeah. He's he's naked too. This is awkward. Right? He is naked and filthy. And they don't like strangers, either, do they? Yeah, it's an isolationist island, so everybody runs away from it. They're afraid of strangers. The young girls are anyway. <laughs> But this is Odysseus's return to the real world. And we get some sense of what's going on here if we look at the very beginning of book six. As Odysseus, the godlike survivor, sleeps, we get this description of the land of Phaeacia. Right? A people who had once lived in Hyperia, page 396, near to the Cyclopes, a race of savages who marauded their land constantly, one day, great Nausithous led his people off to Sharia, a remote island, where he walled off a city, built houses and shrines, and parceled out fields. After he died and went to the world below, Alcinous ruled wise in the gods' ways. So why bother to give us this little thumbnail history of the Phaeacians and their island? Exactly. These are civilized people. The actions that are described here are the actions of a civilizer, right? He builds a city, he builds shrines, he parcels out fields. This is a civilized land. It's orderly. It's properly run. And Monsters are unlikely to eat Odysseus here. This is one thing I want you to take note of um, as you read the rest of the portion that we're going to be looking at, is the notes Odysseus seems to take about the places he lands in, right? Whenever he lands in a new place, pay attention to what he says about it. Because it reveals a lot about um, Greek attitudes towards civilization and towards foreigners. So the definition of civilization we have here is, you know, is an orderly one, right? This is, you know, we have a city, we have fields, we have shrines. We have organized religion, a walled off place to protect the people, and fields for growing our food. And anything that's not that is barbarian. Yeah. Because that's literally where the word comes from, isn't it? Not Greek. Yeah, barbarian means not Greek, and it, was, it comes from um, a Greek joke. Uh, it referred to, uh, it was a way they would refer to people who didn't speak Greek. 
the sound of non-Greek languages they would just imitate as a series of you know, some bar, 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 bar sounds. So a barbarian was someone who didn't speak Greek. So yeah, he's looking not just for civilization generally, but he's looking for Greek civilization. He's looking for people who follow his own cultural practices. And we'll see in a moment whether or not these people measure up. All right, so Athena convinces the princess to go down to the water where she will meet the stranger. He wakes up on 399. When she was about to fold the clothes, yoke the mules, and head back home, the gray-eyed one sprung her plan. Odysseus would wake up, see the lovely girl, and she would lead him to the Phaeacian city. The princess threw the ball to one of the girls, but it sailed wide into the deep, swirling water. The girl screamed, and Odysseus awoke. Stirring up, he tried to puzzle it out. What kind of land have I come to now? Are the natives wild and lawless savages, or God-fearing men who welcome strangers? That sounded like girls screaming, or the cry of the spirit women who hold the high peaks. The river wells in the grassy meadows. Can I be close to human voices? I'll go and have a look for myself. So he cannot yet determine whether the sounds he hears are those of human beings or of spirits without going out and having a look for himself, right? Unfortunately, he happens to be, at the moment, salty and naked. With that, Odysseus emerged from the bushes. He broke off a leafy branch from the undergrowth and held it before him to cover himself. A weathered mountain lion steps into a clearing, confident in his strength, eyes glowing. The wind and rain have led up, and he's hunting cattle, sheep, or wild deer, but is hungry enough to jump the stone walls of the animal pens. Now, these bits in italics, right, you see a lot of these. Have you noticed any particular pattern to them? When we go to these little, little bits in italics, do you notice any particular thing they always tend to be doing? Are we actually still in the narrative when we hit the italics? No. Yeah, we're actually being removed from the narrative for a moment, right? And what is this little itali italicized portion doing? It's What's it about? It's kind of giving a description of him coming out of the bushes. Yeah. Comparing him to a mountain lion. Yeah, these extended comparisons are called Homeric similes. You find them in the Iliad as well. Like a Homeric? Homeric similes, yep. So-called because this is really kind of the first place historically we find um, this particular kind of extended simile. And the whole idea here is, on the one hand, to remind us of things outside of the narrative, but also usually to make some sort of larger point about the plot and about what's happening, right? So what is Odysseus compared to here? A weathered mountain lion, right? And he's jumping into the animal pens. So he's going from wild animals to domesticated animals. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, it seems like I mean, it's saying he's hunting the others, but yeah. he'll settle for the animal in the animal pen. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like he's still trying to be like the great lion, I guess you could say. Yeah, when I think the the you know the idea of Odysseus as a lion here as well, right? He's a predator. On the one hand, Odysseus is seeking civilization, right? He wants to return to civilization, but he's also a destroyer of cities. <coughs> he's a destroyer of other civilizations, right? He didn't build the wooden horse that destroyed Troy, but it was his idea and he commanded the soldiers that were inside the horse. Right, so this is a reminder that Odysseus may be the hero of the epic, but he's not an especially nice guy. Right, Odysseus is out to fill his own belly. 
He is a trickster hero who will destroy what he has to in order to get what he wants. So Odysseus advanced upon these ringleted girls, naked as he was. What choice did he have? He was a frightening sight, disfigured with brine, and the girls fluttered off to the jutting beaches. Only Alcinous' daughter stayed. Athena put courage in her heart and stopped her trembling. She held her ground, and Odysseus wondered how to approach this beautiful girl. Should, should he fall at her knees, or keep his distance, and ask her with honeyed words to show him the way to the city and give him some clothes? He thought it over and decided it was better to keep his distance and not take the chance of offending the girl by touching her knees. What, what's with the, does anybody know what's up with the touching the knees? Why he's wondering about touching her knees? Probably your attention or something like that. He's not trying to have sex. No, it actually, it, it, yeah, it's, it's actually, it is not in any way a sexual um, advance. It's a ritualized gesture that was specific to Greek culture. If you are a stranger coming to a new place and you are asking someone for help, you are supposed to drop down and grab that person's knees. By like praising them or bowing to them or something like that? Yeah, you are bowing to them, right? But essentially what you're doing, it's not so much about praising them as it is about putting yourself in their power. Right? So you have... Like a, a respect thing? Like I'm, I'm trusting you with my life. Yeah, it, it is, yeah. Help. I think, yeah, like, probably respect, not so much trust, definitely. Yeah, it's like I am going to trust you to give me the help that I need, right? By showing my own weakness here. And if someone makes this gesture to you, according to Greek rules of hospitality, you are supposed to help them. Is that a firm rule, or is that like a... It's a pretty, it, it's a, I mean, not legally codified rule, but there's a very strong tradition. And, um, you know, part of the tradition was that Zeus loved those who helped the stranger. And if you were someone who was unkind to strangers, um, the gods are probably going to get back at you in some way, right? So this is it, it, it's it's largely it's kind of a religious rule. Now, why might he be doubting whether he should perform this gesture or not? Because he's in Greece. <laughs> yeah. Okay. On the one hand, he's naked and disgusting. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but yeah, he also yeah he does not know if this girl will understand the gesture, right? And if someone came at me like that, I'd probably like, get the heck away from me. Well, right, because you're not Greek. Well, also, isn't he kind of contemplating if she's a goddess or not? Yeah, he's not sure if he's back in the real world yet. Right, are these- Would it be offensive to do that to a goddess? Or would it be the same not, level of- it, 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 would be, it would be sort of the same. In fact, you actually see um, the gods doing it to each other all the time in Epic. Um, particularly, um, goddesses will ask Zeus for a favor. They'll grab him around the knees and touch his beard. Right? <clears throat> so, it's not necessarily something you're not supposed to do to a god, but it is a gesture that can be easily misinterpreted by somebody who doesn't follow these particular traditions. So if she happens to be an evil spirit, right? She might try to trick him if he puts herself in his if she if he puts himself in her power. If she happens to be a hostile goddess, right? He might get stuck like he was on Agigia for 10 years. Right? There are all sorts of unpleasant eventualities that could result from this. So he figures it's safer to just address her from a distance, since he does not know if she'll follow the custom. Now, as it turns out, does he actually have anything to worry about? Now, these people, in fact, do follow specific Greek customs. Right? Once he gets to the city, he finds that, in fact, it is organized like a Greek city with a palace 
at the center and a sort of an agora or a sort of public marketplace, public gathering place. Right. As Nausicaa, as Nausicaa the princess describes it to him on page 403, right, close by the road you will find a grove of Athena, beautiful poplars surrounded by a meadow. A spring flows through it. Right there is my father's estate and vineyard. Okay, agriculture, a good sign. About as far from the city as a shout would carry, sit down there and wait for a while until we reach the city and arrive at my house. When you think you've had enough, we've had enough time to get there, go into the city and ask any Phaeacian for the house of my father, Lord Osinous. It's very easy to spot, and any child can lead you there. There's no other house in all Phaeacia built like the house of the hero Osinous. Once you're safely within the courtyard, go quickly through the hall until you come to my mother. She'll be sitting by the hearth in the firelight, spinning sea blue yarn, a sight worth seeing, as she leans against a column, her maids behind her. Right beside her, my father sits on his throne, sipping his wine like an immortal god. Pass him by and throw your arms around my mother's knees. If you want to see your homeland soon, however far it may be. If she smiles upon you, there is hope that you will return to your home and see your loved ones again. So one, she tells him right off, if you follow the custom, we'll listen to you, right? If you follow the usual custom, we'll help you. Throw your arms around my mother's knees, she'll send you home. But the way the household is set up is also encouraging for Odysseus. The Greek word for household is oikos. This is not simply a brand of particularly difficult to swallow Greek yogurt of the sort favored by former TV star John Stamos, who I imagine was probably just the closest available Greek-American celebrity they could get. Um, but I digress. So oikos, like, like I said, means household. And the Greek household was split up according to gender divisions. In general, the rooms at the front of the home, you know, receiving rooms, dining hall for guests, uh, if there was a shop in the home, these were the territory of the men. Right? This was male territory. The outside world, in general, was male territory. As you went further into the house, the kitchens, the hearth, you know, the rooms in which the family slept, that was the woman's domain. So the fact that the queen here is sitting by the hearth weaving, which was also regarded as women's work by the Greeks, that shows Odysseus that he's back, right? that these people follow Greek customs. Right, that the wife sits by the hearth, weaving. The husband sits on his throne, drinking wine and waiting to receive guests. Yes, OK. This is how things are supposed to be for a Greek. And indeed, Odysseus's whole mission is essentially to restore his own oikos, right? to restore his own household to proper order. So here we see a properly ordered household that shows hospitality to guests. So <clears throat> what else did you make? Was there anything that you found particularly weird or interesting about his little trip to Phaeacia? I know that this is probably not the most exciting portion of the epic. Right? There are no monsters here. Nobody does any fighting. Odysseus's life is never at risk, right? Yeah, Darlene, what were you going to say? I was just curious, because I haven't read the whole thing, I've only read the portion that we were instructed mm -hmm. to read. Why is it an issue that Athena is helping him? Okay. Like, she says that like, she might get in trouble for helping him. Okay, um, yeah. And one thing we might remember about polytheistic belief systems from Gilgamesh, do the gods always agree with each other or get along? No. Typically not, right? In fact, there will often be uh, <coughs> rivalries, you know, 
in part because of different overlapping spheres of influence, right? Um, Athena is the goddess of what? Does anybody know? Yeah, wisdom, strategy, tactics. The goddess of war in its nobler forms. Wait, can you repeat all that? You said Athena is the god of what? Wisdom, strategy, tactics, knowledge, crafts, and war in its nobler forms. The actual god of war was Ares, wasn't it? Ares is the god of war in its more objectionable... Uh, Ares is more the god of carnage than the god of war, right? Um, Athena is the goddess of war um, in a just cause. The, war, you know, the goddess of war as um, strategic exercise. Ares is the god of people chopping each other up into little bits. So that would be sort of the primary difference uh, between uh, the two of them. So Athena favors Odysseus because he's smart, right? He's a clever hero. He's a strategist. Now, Athena is in conflict in this respect. with Poseidon, the god of earth and sea. Because Poseidon has been keeping him away from home, hasn't he? Poseidon is the reason, yes, that Odysseus has not been able to make it home. Poseidon has cursed Odysseus for reasons that we'll get to next time. But yeah, the reason why Athena believes she might get in trouble or cause conflict by siding with Odysseus, yeah, it has entirely to do with, with the fact that Poseidon hates him. But if Poseidon hated him that much, would he be following Odysseus just as much as Athena is to counteract what she's doing? He has been. Okay. Yeah, he, ha he has been. And see, this, this is the other thing to note um, about Greek, like the reason why Poseidon hasn't simply, say, killed him. Um, the Greeks believed very, very strongly in fate. It's personified as three goddesses, are uh, usually called um, the Fates, or in Greek, the Moiré. Is that the three goddesses? Three goddesses, yes. I think that's how you spell it. M-O-I-R-I-A-E. Um, and essentially, it was these goddesses who determined how long you were going to live and when you were going to die. And there wasn't really much that other gods could do about this, right? <laughs> Your ultimate fate was set at birth. So even though Poseidon hates him, he can't do anything about it because if it's the fate's will that he gets home, he's going to get back home no matter what. He's just making it longer. Exactly, longer. exactly. Yes, he, yes. He, um, Poseidon can't stop Odysseus from getting home, but he can make him miserable the whole time he's trying to get home. And he can make Odysseus arrive at home a broken and battered wreck of a man, right? Didn't, is that, wasn't it something like 40 years? Well, he, he's, uh, he's gone to Troy for 10. And uh, he's, the Odyssey, he's gone for about, the, yeah, I mean, it's, he's gone a good long time, right? Uh, years he yeah, much, much longer um, than we would think for a uh, for his son to still be a boy. One thing when we read in high school, I won't say it was the two poems were pretty much two halves of the same whole. One was ten years, the other was ten years, so twenty years give or take. And then of course there was some time when he was with Calypso, I think. His, he's with he's with Calypso for a decade, and he's with Circe for a year. Yes, but for some reason or other, time seemed to didn't necessarily stand still. Something like it sped up. He didn't think he'd been there for a decade. Right, right. And you will, it's, this is actually one thing that we, if we look at the scenes like that have like the little cutaways to Mount Olympus, we see differences in the way the gods live and the way human beings live. That for the gods, there basically is no time and there are no consequences, right? Um, the gods' little disputes are always fairly easily smoothed over. Nobody endures any punishment for very long. Um, and... <clears throat> You know, in the end, for them, everything just goes on as it, as it always does, right? Because as we remember from looking at Utanapishtim and Gilgamesh, right? 
if you're immortal, time is basically meaningless. Yeah, Kayla. Um, what's going on with the Monica's song? Okay, which one? Uh, the one where he's talking about Aphrodite and how he drank, he, um, drank Aphrodite and it catching him uh -huh. catching her teeth. Okay, Why yes. That is actually a very good question uh, because it doesn't seem to have anything obvious to do. Is it just making him like kind of think? about his life back home and kind of giving him more reason to want to go home because he's kind of relating to his wife? Um, it does actually relate to Odysseus' situation, right? I mean, essentially, by sleeping with Hephaestus' wife in Hephaestus' house, in Hephaestus' bed, what is Ares violating? What rule is he violating? Apart from the fact that he's committing adultery, period. No, Aphrodite is a goddess too. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was pretty common for males to commit adultery. I didn't think that was a big deal. Well, it was, unless you were sleeping with someone else's wife, right? Um, In general, a Greek man could sleep with whoever or whatever he wanted, and his wife had no power to do anything about it. This was just sort of culturally accepted. But. Because women were regarded first as property of their fathers and then of their husbands, right? If a man slept with another man's wife, he was messing with another man's property. Ergo, then it becomes a crime, right? Then it becomes a problem. But so, wouldn't it be a, sorry for interrupting, but wouldn't mm -hmm. that be like kind of against the father, though, if they're not married? Generally, if a Greek man is sleeping with a woman to whom he's not married, um, you'll see in Greek poetry and Greek art a lot of references to flute girls. Flute girls are prostitutes. Yeah. So that's how they kind of get around that. So there you go. This is you know, one of the kind of darker, nastier aspects of, uh, of Greek culture generally. But <clears throat> the fact that Ares sleeps with Aphrodite, right? In Hephaestus' house, in Hephaestus' bed, he's violating the same kind of rules that the suitors in Odysseus' house are violating, right? He's violating that law of hospitality by misusing Hephaestus' home. So <clears throat> the fact that Hephaestus, who is not himself a warrior, devises a cunning trap, a cunning trick, in order to catch Ares, that's some sort of foreshadowing of what Odysseus is going to do about the suitors, right? Now, because Ares is a god, he gets away, and there's you know no real consequence for him, except embarrassment. But <clears throat> when Odysseus gets his hands on the suitors, there will be real consequences for them. So yeah, the, that plot there is an analog to the overall plot of the epic. Right. Hephaestus restores order in his own home through trickery, much as Odysseus is going to have to restore order in his own home when he gets back uh, to Ithaca. And I mean, that's, look, I mean, there's, there's no real way around it. Greek culture was overall pretty misogynistic. Um, you know, men basically controlled everything. Um, <clears throat> women had few, if any, rights. They had no rights to their own children. Um, they did not have the right to own property, um, except in Sparta because the men were always off fighting wars. Um, so it was practical to give women some property rights there. Um, but yeah, by and large, uh, women were really more or less third class citizens. And this will be, um, this, this will come out, this, this issue will come out in sort of stark relief when we read Medea uh, next week. 
But in the Odyssey, it is kind of, it's kind of a side issue. It's there in the background. It'll become a bigger issue um, when we look next time at the Circe episode. Um, but yeah, just so you know that this is there, right? This is a basic feature of Greek civilization. Um, anything else that struck you as interesting or strange about this? What do the Phaeacians do in the stranger's honor, apart from just giving him a ship and sending him home? Feasts and games, yes. This is another. This is more evidence of civilization. Right, the games that they participate in: boxing, foot racing. Track, yeah. Yep, disc, 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 Yeah, what we think of as largely track and field events. Right, these were actually. Um, these kind of in a Greek athletic competition, what these were really about was military preparedness. Um, they were all um, events that helped a soldier train in some way. So on the one hand, um, you know these are civilized arts in which civilized people with organized armies participate. But it's also a way of showing off your strength to a stranger. Oh, this is, I mean, good job, but this is they want to participate at first until one mm -hmm. of the man kept on calling him out and forcing yeah. him. Yeah. Well, there are reasons, too, why he might not want to participate, right? Perhaps the same reasons why he hides his tears when the, the uh, minstrel is singing about the Trojan War, right? If he is seen to be a man of great prowess, if he is seen to be crying when a bard sings about Achilles and Agamemnon, what does that do? What might that do? Show that he's vulnerable. Well, it might, it might show, I mean, the crying does show vulnerability. Although, um, yeah, yeah, crying for Greek men wasn't as big a deal as we tend to make it, right? They didn't have to be generally quite so stoic. Is it because they would want to know like, why that upset him and then he would have to explain who he was? Yes. Up to this point, he's remained incognito. Right? He has not yet revealed his identity to these people. Why might it be in his best interest not to? Eventually, yeah. Start a war. I think mm -hmm. that would upset Poseidon, which watches over his area of the city. Yeah, and we'll we'll get <clears throat> we'll get to uh, some. Uh, yeah, it might be to protect them from Poseidon's wrath, right? You help you know you help this guy. I hate. Is that why they're concerned in making a good impression about being a host? So, because they're scared that once he goes home, he'll start a war. Well, if if you're a bad ho well if you're a bad host then, yeah, that could encourage uh, the person whom you hosted to mount, something, mount up something against you. Um, so certainly showing their prowess in these military games shows the stranger that they're ready if he wants to start something. Um, but... But we're going to be nice to you so you don't... Exactly, yeah. And, you know, of course, you know, there would be the punishment of Zeus on those who do not care for the stranger. But remember, too, where Odysseus is coming from. Right? He's on his way home from an enormous war that drug in a whole region and ended with the destruction of another civilization. He does not necessarily know which side of that conflict these people would fall on, right? Top of that, he was like out of the game for like ten years, so he doesn't even know mm -hmm. his culture could have already started a war with them. He doesn't even know that much, mm -hmm. even if they would they weren't on different sides before, right? Yeah, so there is some safety in remaining incognito, right? And then once he's felt out the lay of the land, right? Remember, he's you know he's even been disguised by Athena, 
who has made him look more glorious and handsome than he really is. Once he spied out the lay of the land here, figured out how things are, then he can begin his tale. And one thing to remember, you know, we're going to be reading the first part of Odysseus's tale to the Phaeacians next time. But one thing to remember about this, one thing I want you to think about as you're reading it, is there anybody else alive who can verify Odysseus's story? Pardon? What I, this is what I want you to think about for next time, right? When Odysseus starts telling his own story, is there anybody who can verify the de anybody alive who can verify the details of Odysseus' journey? And that's just, we'll, we'll leave with that. I just want you to kind of keep that in mind. Think about that as you're reading. All right, I have some guide questions for you. Do with them when you will. I have in-class writings to return to you from last time.